Hello, and welcome to the preoperative total hip replacement class. My name is Katarina Lukasik, and I am the inpatient physical therapy supervisor here at Kaiser Santa Rosa. The purpose of this video is to explain what occurs during your hospitalization. I know you'd be feeling some anxiety towards your upcoming surgery. I truly believe that if you know what to expect from your visit, it will make the entire process less stressful. You can approach this experience knowing what will happen, instead of wondering what will happen next. This video will be divided into four sections. Section 1, by orthopedic surgeon Dr. Andy Goldstein, will cover the anatomy of the hip and the method by which your hip is replaced during surgery. In the second section, I will describe your hospital stay. This will cover everything from the equipment attached to you when you wake up from surgery, to the criteria we use in determining your discharge home. The third section will review home hip safety tips. I'll review the steps you can take to make your home a safer place. And just in case there have been topics not covered in the video, what I'll do to finish is I'll finish with questions most commonly asked in my class. Hello, I'm Dr. Andy Goldstein, part of the orthopedic department here at Santa Rosa Kaiser and I've been asked to talk a little bit about artificial hips and some of the anatomy involved. As you can see on this skeleton, the hip joint has a lot of range of motion and is covered in the front by several muscles and covered in the back by several muscles. We don't need the skeleton anymore. Now that he's gone, let me show you a little bit about the actual artificial hip. This represents the top of your left femur bone up by your hip. Once the surgeon has made the cuts in the bone, this metal stem will be placed down the femur bone and some type of ball, either ceramic or metal, will be placed on top of the femur component. Next, the pelvis will be worked on. This represents the left pelvis and a metal shell with most likely a plastic cup will be inserted into the pelvic bone. Once all the parts are in place, your hip will be able to move all over. I hope this brief explanation of some of the anatomy of the hip as well as what an actual artificial hip will look like, will help you understand what will occur at your upcoming surgery. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Now that you have a basic understanding of the anatomy of the hip and the surgical process, we can move on. When you wake up, you'll notice a lot of paraphernalia attached to you. I'll start at your head and then travel down your body. In your nose, you'll have a cannula. And this is just a simple plastic tube carrying oxygen. By protocol, all my patients get this and it's simply put there to help maintain oxygen levels in your blood during surgery. I usually remove this the morning after surgery. Moving down, you'll have an IV, usually attached to your arm. This is the means by which you'll receive fluid. And even importantly for you, more importantly for you, your pain medication enters through this site. I want to emphasize you are in control of your own pain medication. The PCA, which is attached to your IV, looks like a pen and looks like this. Here at the top, there's a button and you can press it to administer your own pain medicine. Now you may be asking yourself, how do I know when to press it? You press it when your pain level is above a 4 to 5 out of 10. What does that mean, you may be asking yourself. On a 0 to 10 pain scale, 0 being that you have no pain whatsoever, and 10 being excruciating pain, 4 or 5 is right in, the, in between, in the middle. You don't want to go above that 4 or 5. I also want to let you know, you can't overdose yourself. You can press this button every 30 seconds, you still will only get pain medication once every 10 to 15 minutes. The last thing I want to really emphasize to you is you don't want to fall behind in your pain. 
you're, they just saw through your bone. Obviously that's going to hurt, so don't be stoic. Don't be afraid to press it. It'll make our time together that much easier for you. So I'm going to go ahead and keep on moving down. You're going to be noticing when you wake up also a tube exiting from your hip joint. That tube acts as a drain and removes excess blood from the surgical site. It's usually taken out the second morning after surgery. You also have a catheter placed to empty your bladder. This way the first day after surgery you won't have to worry about getting up to go to the bathroom. Next I want to show you something called a wedge. Wedge looks like this. Okay, you can see it's triangular shaped. And what it's done is put between your legs and that way it spreads your legs apart so you will not dislocate your new hip. But you know, we'll talk about the hip uh, precautions a little later. Lastly, you're going to have around your calves little massagers and those help to promote uh, the blood flow in your leg and it also further decreases your chances of blood clots. So let's kind of review that from the top again just to keep it straight. When you wake up you'll have a cannula in your nose, you'll have an IV in your arm, you'll have your PCA pump attached to that, you'll have a catheter in your bladder, coming out of your hip you'll have a little plastic tube, the drain, the wedge between your legs, and then finally the little massagers I was talking about. Okay. Now, moving on, I'd like to talk about your hip precautions. During the surgery, the doctor combines three positions in order to dislocate your hip and perform the surgery. The first position is bending your hip up past the 90 degree angle. This is followed by crossing their surgical leg past your belly button and finally rotating the entire leg inward. So, Guess what are the three positions you want to avoid like the plague for the next two to six weeks? You got it. Those three. Let's review each one one more time. Number one, don't cross your legs. Number two, don't bend at the hip greater than 90 degrees. What does that mean? When you're sitting, simply do not bend forward. Okay. The last thing you want to avoid is not twisting your entire leg inward. So when you're walking, avoid pigeon toe. Remember, if you do not follow these three rules during the first few weeks, you're at a high risk for dislocating your new hip. Most patients are at the greatest risk actually for dislocation about two to three weeks after surgery. The reason for this is because there's really little pain at that point to warn you of potential dislocation. So be mindful, you can still dislocate your new hip even if there's no pain into certain positions. With my help and the help of whoever your PT is, you will learn and memorize these rules during your time in the hospital. They'll be nearly automatic before you leave. We'll go on now and talk about your hospital stay. The typical hospital stay is about three days. The physical therapist will see you twice a day. During this time, um, we will teach you the following. Okay, so we're going to divide this into three days. Day one, I'm going to be teaching you how to get in and out of bed. I'm going to be teaching you how to go from sit to stand using a walker. And depending on how you're feeling, uh, we'll take a few steps with the walker. Now I want to really tell you, if you're feeling horrible, I'm not going to be doing all that. This is really depending on how you are feeling, okay? I have people who don't do anything else than sit up at the edge of the bed. I have other people who walk 10 feet. Again, completely what you can do. On the second day, I'm going to again review what we did on the first day, how to get in and out of bed, again how to go from sit to stand, and then hopefully you'll feel better, we'll increase the distance you can walk. The second morning is the morning when I'll be getting you up into a chair, and that is just about right. People start feeling better the second morning and they want to sit up. Um, your catheter that I had mentioned previously is going to be removed your second morning. Now, day three. That's your final day. That's test day. I make certain, and whoever your physical therapist will make certain you have everything down pat before you go home. The goal of physical therapy is to prepare you for home. Remember, there's nothing at home which you will not have first practice with us here at the hospital and have mastered it. 
what we did is we used a checklist to determine if you're safe to go home. That checklist is comprised of three goals. And they'll sound familiar. Goal number one is they can get in and out of bed by yourself or with minimal assistance if you have a caregiver that's going to be helping you at home. Number two, independently transferring from sitting to a standing position without losing your balance and that's either from a bed, from a chair or a commode using a walker. We'll be practicing all three. The last point is walking 25 feet with a walker without losing your balance. Now if you have a caregiver they have to be present on the final day of physical therapy to be trained in assisting you in moving properly and to assure you can manage safely at home. If uh, the patient is going to go home and I see you're not safe to do so, I may send you to rehabilitation to achieve those goals. In other words, let's say you can't get out of bed by yourself. Let's say you can't sit to stand without losing your balance. Let's say you can't walk that 25 feet. Okay, I will not send you home. I really want you to understand that we're working together. I want to ensure you that we're working as a team and I'm not going to send you home unless you're safe to go home. Okay, so now I want to talk about equipment that will be coming home with you. Usually um, when you come home from the hospital, there are two things that are provided for the hospital. One is a front wheel walker and um, I'll show you that a little later. And the other thing is a three in one commode. Now this commode looks like a chair. It can, it's called a three-in-one because it can be used for three things. You can take the pot out and put it over a regular toilet seat that we have nice armrests you can push off of. Okay, You can use it as a shower chair, take it out and put it in the shower. And you can also use it obviously as a commode by your bedside if you're having a bad day. Okay, I'd like to remind you something because I mentioned showers. You may not take a shower or introduce water to the incision until your staples are out and the incision's healed. Okay, This usually occurs somewhere around 10 to 14 days after surgery during your first post-operative doctor's visit. Now, can you guess why we allow only sponge bath after surgery? If you guess to prevent the risk of infection, that's right. You don't want to rinse bacteria into your wound bed. Any additional equipment that you may need will be determined by you and I, by the physical therapist and yourself. Some individuals prefer crutches or may need a hospital bed to go home. And what we'll do is we'll determine together what you need to assist you in your home environment. There are a few other items I want to mention to you which might be helpful. They're not mandatory. You don't absolutely need them, but I want to show them to you. One is called a reacher. Pretty nice little gadget. You can squeeze here. You can see here. You can pick things up. Remember, one of your hip precautions, you can't bend forward. So this way you can go to pick things up using this. The second thing I found really helpful is this uh, long shoehorn. Again, you can't quite bend forward the first couple of weeks because it's stiff and painful. So you can actually slide this into your shoe and that way you can get your shoe on a little more easily. Okay, well, I wanted to give you some phone numbers and names of companies that carry what are called total hip replacement kits. The primary here in Santa Rosa is Medical Dynamics at area code 707-573-0302. Another one is Redwood Medical Supplies, 707-585-6800. Lastly is Med Pacific Medical Supplies, 707-769-9606. I want to let you know all three companies deliver and they also accept credit card orders. Remember again, these are not necessarily needed to make to, to, for you to get home, but it can take a little help to get around the house and these things can really help. It will make recovery time at home easier. Now, we're talking about home, let's move on and talk about how to arrange your house to allow you to walk about the house a little more safely. We'll start with the different rooms in the house and I'll kind of describe each room. We'll start with the living room. The first thing I want to talk to you is about couches. 
do not get into a deep or low couch for two reasons. One, you could dislocate your hip. And number two, think about a deep couch. You're gonna be like a turtle on its back trying to get out of that couch, okay? What you wanna do is have something that is pretty high up. If um, you have a chair with armrests, that would probably be a lot better. The reason being is a chair with armrests, you can push off the chair and get out of it that way. You can make the chair even higher by putting a pillow in it, and that way makes it even easier to stand. Now, rugs. You want to take out throw rugs. Okay, think about walking with a walker. You can trip over that pretty easily. Electric cords. Anything coming across the hallway without surgery, you may notice it. But having that walker, you may not see it. You could trip over it. Another little handy tip, cordless phones. Have it next to you, because if you have a phone that's on the wall to get up, it's going to be a lot of strain to get up to have to answer that phone. The last thing I want to also mention, this is just an idea also to make it easier, is night lights. Those are really going to help avoid falls. Now, we talked about the living room. I'm going to move on to the kitchen. There's one rule I talk to everybody about, and it's the hip to shoulder rule. Now, what I want to mention to you is after surgery, you're not going to be able to bend down very low and you're not going to be able to reach up very high because your balance is not going to be that great. Okay, So all the things that you're going to be needing in the kitchen, you want it to be between hip and shoulder height. Okay, So your cereal boxes, if they're way up high, guess what? You're not going to be able to get to them. And your pots, if they're worried that way down low, you're not going to be able to get to those either. So go through your kitchen, look at the things you're going to be needing, Keep it between hip to shoulder height, okay? Now, going to the bathroom, it's the same rule, your hip to shoulder rule. Keep your toilet paper out, okay? Your hair dryer, your toothpaste, have it on top of the countertop. You don't want to have it way down low or way up high somewhere in the medicine cabinet. Now, in the bedroom, it's a little easier, but the one thing most people forget are their drawers. You don't want to have your socks way at the bottom, okay? Your t-shirts, all the things you need on a daily basis, have it at the top drawer versus at the bottom. Um, I want to also mention shoes. You're not going to be able to get on a tie-on shoe, okay? It's going to be too difficult. You're not going to be able to bend forward in the beginning to get to it. So have a slip-on shoe, okay? It makes things a lot easier for you. Last thing I want to mention is loose clothing. Have things you can just zip up over the top, nice loose sweats, things that you can get on easily. Okay, so those are things you can do around your house to make it easier for you. Now, if you have a spouse or a significant other, they can assist you with everything. But for those people who live alone, please arrange to have someone drive you home from the hospital. I've had a few f poor souls who remembered everything else but having someone pick them up from the hospital. Okay, I don't want that to be you. Um, you want to have, if you don't have someone to help you at the house, you can hire someone to help you cook and clean for a few days and do shopping. We have a service here at Kaiser Physical Therapy um, through discharge planning. They can get someone to help you. The phone number you call for discharge planning is area code 707-571-3000. And what they can do is provide information on prices and coverage that you may have if you wish to hire help. Now, I'd like to close this video with a question and answer session using questions that are commonly asked in my total hip replacement class. This is things I may not have covered that I wanted you guys to know. First question I get asked a whole lot of times, how long before I can drive? I tell people about six weeks. Make sure you can bear full weight on that leg and you're not walking around with a walker anymore and you're not using a cane, okay? Because that tells me your leg is not strong enough to drive. What I do is I encourage my patients to do a test run in an empty parking lot before you go back on the road. A lot of people are surprised to find the reaction time to hit that gas and brake pedal is a lot slower than a surgical leg. When we're still talking about driving, another question I get is, how do I get a temporary handicap decal? 
what I tell people is first talk to the doctor before surgery and you can pick up the forms over at your local DMV. A typical question I get as well is how long is my surgery? I tell people anywhere between two to three hours and along the heels of that question so how long is my new hip gonna last? About 15 years is the answer to that one. Another question I get asked often is how long will I be walking with a walker or crutches after my surgery? The answer to that question is somewhere around four to five weeks. Now I want to remind you the stronger you are coming into surgery, meaning that you're able to walk and you're able to get around, the faster you'll be able to not use those, that walker again, the crutches again. On the other hand, if you came into the hospital in a wheelchair and you were not able to walk very well, that means the muscles are weaker and it'll take longer for you to be walking with the walker and crutches. Um, another question I get asked is, how long is my hospital stay? Like we discussed before, it's somewhere around three days. Now, if you feel better, you might leave as soon as two days, and if you're having a bad time, you may be a little longer, maybe four days. One thing I really want to review with you is this next question. What should I do if I'm going to have dental surgery? It is best to have dental surgery done before your hip replacement. If you are to have dental work done after surgery, please remember to tell your dentist that you have a prosthetic hip, you've had a hip replacement, and this way the dentist will know to prescribe antibiotics. The reason for this is that cuts in your mouth can uh, result in bacteria entering your bloodstream and that potentially can lead to infection in your hip. Remember to check with your dentist or physician prior to any dental work. Now here's a little more of a delicate subject, but I get asked this question as well. How soon can I have sex after surgery? What I tell my patients is remember to keep your hip precautions, otherwise as it is comfortable for you. The last question I wanted to go over is questions as what activities may I do? And on this I want to emphasize avoiding high impact activities. Jogging, tennis, things like that. Low to no impact is encouraged and that would be things like walking and swimming. Again, once your wound is healed, biking is fine, hiking is fine. The reason you don't want to do high impact activities is because then you'll wear down the hip. This brings to a close the preoperative total hip replacement class. Thank you for your attention. If you do have any further questions, please do not hesitate to call me. I'm here nearly every day. My phone number is area code 707-571-4831. Thank you very much. Bye.